Welcome to week four of Theory and Methods. This week we're going to focus on social action theories. So we're going to look at Weber, we're going to look at some key concepts, we're going to look at symbolic interactionism, labeling, dramaturgical mov model, brief overview of other types of action theories, phenomenology and ethnomethodology, and we will end with structuration theory. I'll try to make synoptic links as we go through um, to year one, review and revise, and year two, we're going to look at some links to beliefs and crime. So rather than copying and making extensive notes from this video tutorial, I want you to summarize in a table. It does look like this. Now it is a big one. So put your seatbelts on because we're on two pages. Okay. So if you want to type on it, that's fine. Link is below. If you want to copy it out, that's okay. Just make it how, as you want. Okay. So our first activity, our starter task to this is some social action research. So interactionist sociologists are not looking at the macro. We're not looking at society as a whole. We are micro sociologists and we are really interested in exploring the day to day interactions that you might see around you. And these often use an interpretivist method to find out the meanings that people attach to their behavior. Now, one of these methods is observation. And I want to encourage you to do loads of observations if you can to put some of the ideas into practice. So your first task is doing an observation. So we're going to start off by observing the world around you. And this is called ethnography. And basically that, that means is you are observing and you are writing an account of what you find. OK, now. I'm going to give you three options that you can choose from. Okay, so you can either do your family or you can think about going to a supermarket or you can do it by watching a TV programme. So choose one of those. So if you choose to do your family and you're at home, and you've got people around you, just spend a little bit of time just listening and watching and seeing what they're doing. How are they interacting with each other? Do they talk over one another or do they take it in turns? Do the adults, your mum and dad or uh, whoever you live with, do they speak to other adults in the same way as they speak to children? How might that differ? Um, so just observe what's going on in your home. Now, if you choose the second one, this is the supermarket. OK, so when you're shopping in a supermarket or think back to the last time that you went shopping, what do you notice about people's behaviour? For example, getting a trolley, walking down the aisles, um, going to the till, for example, you could even and this probably is probably the best one to do. You could even consider the impact of the pandemic COVID-19 and social distancing. How has this impacted or changed people's behaviour at the supermarket? And observe carefully, do people conform to the rules going up and down the aisles in one way and keeping the two meters distance? Do they conform or look to see how they might break the rules? And what are other people's reactions? Or if you don't want to go out um, and you want to watch a TV program, just flick on the news or some sort of reality TV program, something like Bargain Hunt or Homes Under the Hammer. How do people act at an auction or in a shop um, and just make comments about their behavior? So just note down what do they what do you see, basically, and ask yourself, why are they acting like this? What meanings are the people attaching to the actions and their behaviors? OK, so that is your first task. And when you are ready, join back in and we'll start to explore Weber. So let's start off with Weber. Now Weber is often associated as being one of the founding fathers of sociology alongside the functionalist Durkheim and the Marxist Karl Marx and he was writing roughly around the same time and one of the things that we do associate with Weber is this thing called verse de hen or empathy. Through observing people's actions we should be able to put ourselves in that other person's shoes to understand why they act in a certain way. Now, he saw both the structure and social action as being important for understanding society. So rather than just focusing on the structure of society like Durkheim and Marx, he looked at the views 
of people's actions and their meanings as also being important. So an explanation is only adequate if it combines the cause, the object, um, st structural factors that shape your behaviour, but also the meanings, the subjective meanings that people attach to their actions. Faber demonstrated the importance of both the structure and the action in his famous work, The Protestant Ethic and the Spirit of Capitalism, which was published in 1905. And he focused on the beliefs of the 17th century Calvinist. Now, these had certain beliefs. They had certain meanings attached to their lives. They believed in this thing called predestination, that God had decided who was saved or damned. And because they didn't know, it sent them into this thing called called a salvation panic. So in order to ensure that they were in God's favour, they changed their behaviour. Okay, so this has shaped their behaviour to ensure that they were in God's favour and to reduce the panic that they felt. They worked hard and they led an ascetic lifestyle. And that just means that they led a simple life. They didn't spend their earnings on luxuries. Instead, they reinvested their profits back into the businesses. And as a result, this belief system, alongside the behaviour, kick-started the birth of modern capitalism. And as we know what that is, it's the systematic pursuit of profit. This isn't the only thing that Faber talked about. He identified that there were four types of actions that people could do. He identified that there were traditional actions. So people act in a way because it's a habit or it's customs, like buying gifts at Christmas. There is also actions that are effectual. So these are expressed by your emotional state. So our actions such as crying at a funeral. We've also got the value rational action. So an action towards a goal that the person describes as desirable. So you might pray to get to heaven or in the case of um, the Calvinist, they work hard in order to get to, to get to heaven or instrumentally rational action. So this is where people calculate the most effective or the most efficient means of achieving a given goal. And you might see that with capitalism. How can you make a profit at the cheapest possible cost? That's that's a rational action. Now to evaluate. He's good because he combines the role of the structure. He recognised there are structures in society that influences people's behaviours. And that is something that functionalists and Marxists fail to do. They don't look at the meanings that individual acts um, attach to their behaviour. But it is too individualistic. He fails to understand shared meanings. For example, how do others understand the meaning that you attach to your behaviour? How, do, how does that, will that work? Um, some actions might have multiple meanings to individual. So an action might be both traditional and rational. And not all actions have meanings. Some things we perform, we do it unconsciously. OK, uh, the idea of verse the hen or putting yourselves in the other person's shoes is very simplistic because we can't be the other person. So we can't truly understand how that other person's feeling. So that is our first few points. That is Max Faber. And just make sure that you are filling in your table as you go along. So let's move on to our second social action theory, which is called symbolic interactionism. And we have got two sociologists that we're going to look at, G. H. Mead and Herbert Bloomer. So our first guy is G. H. Mead, and he saw the world via symbols. Now, a symbol is a thing that we attach a meaning to. He compared us to animals. Now, animals often have a stimulus response. So what that means is if one dog snarls at another, the response is automatic. One dog snarls, the other one snarls back. Human actions have an added phase. It's called an interpretive phase. And it is here where we have to make sense of the other person's actions. And to help us do this, we attach a symbol to it. So think about it like this. If you raised your hand, we've got to interpret what that might mean. So in the classroom, you raise your hand and I as a teacher will think you want to ask a question. Whereas if you raised your hand in an auction, 
this means that you want to buy it. So put simply, we interpret the symbol, raise the hand in the context that we're in, and that will influence our response to it. And that's basically what we mean by symbolic interactionism. So how do we learn the meanings that symbols hold? Well, we learn it through the significant other and they are our parents. So through family, through primary socialization, but also through play as well, we learn what the symbols mean and, and the way to respond to them. But then we also learn it through the generalized other when we go into the wider society uh, and also through education as well, through secondary socialization. So our second um, symbolic interactionist is Herbert Bloomer and he developed his ideas and he came up with three key th principles which you can see does overlap with Mead. So our first one is we have actions that are based on meanings that we give to um, events or people and it's he agrees that we're not like animals, but we have this added um, interpretive phase. Um, secondly, meanings arise from the interactions, but they're not fixed. So the second point is there is not a fixed response. And the third is that the meanings that we give are the result of the interpretive procedures that we use, especially in taking the role of the other. But he argues that actions are partly predictable, but they're not completely fixed. There is room for negotiation. And that's the bit that we just want to add about Bloomer, that there is some negotiation. To evaluate, functionalists would argue that there is no negotiation of actions. Through socialization and social control, this ensures that people conform to society's norms and act in a predictable and fixed way, which would maintain consensus. So they challenge his ideas somewhat. Okay, so make sure that your table is filled in best you can, and then we'll move on to our next action theory. So let's look at our next theory, which is labeling theory. And we will have encountered this in year one as part of education. So what is labeling theory? Well, basically when we define something, we label it. And that just means we attach a label or a meaning to it. A label is a definition that we attach to something. And we've encountered this in year one, we looked at labeling students. And there are a few concepts that we're going to look at. The Lufkin Glass self, the self-fulfilling prophecy, career and master status. So firstly, Thomas, he argued that if you define the situation as real, there will be real consequences. Now that just means that if we label something, there will be a consequence. Okay, so Cooley identified this and he called it the looking glass self, that if you get labelled, we start to see ourselves in the way that we have been labelled, basically. So it's like looking in a mirror. And that's very similar to what Rosenthal and Jacobson identified in the self-fulfilling prophecy, in that we become what others see us as. We fulfil the prophecy. We live up to the high expectations or the low expectations of that other person. And a couple of things that Becca talks about, and we'll go into a bit more detail with these when we look at the synoptic link, is deviant career and master status. So just to explain these in a bit more detail, let's look at the synoptic links. Okay, so firstly, within education, we looked at the self-fulfilling prophecy and labeling process that teachers had a preconceived idea of the ideal pupil they had in their head, what was an ideal pupil? And that was according to Becker. And usually this ideal pupil was middle class, they taught with an elaborate code and they came well prepared to the class. And any students that failed to meet this ideal were labeled negatively and were treated as failures. And this led us to conclude that working class were labeled negatively and that led to their failure in school. And this leads to a self-fulfilling prophecy. Now we know that some students can reject this label. So remember that when we come to evaluate. Now, Becker didn't just write about the ideal pupil. He also wrote about crime and deviance and he saw labeling occur within that and some of the key things that he identified, I've put in bold. So he identified 
that the people that were doing the labeling were called the moral entrepreneurs. And these are the people that go on this crusade to, in the case of crime, to change the law. They think that it's doing it for the better. But the result of this is that some people get labelled when they break that law and they often become an outsider. And this is a result of his research into the marijuana users and they become an, and they become an outsider. As a result of being labelled, people become only seen as their label. It becomes their master status. So if you think about the way that I perceive, I'm perceived as a woman, a mother, a teacher, but to you, my master status is I am the teacher that is that overrides all other statuses that I have. Likewise, if you've been labelled as a criminal, you become seen as a criminal and it overrides the fact that you are a son or a daughter or that you have got other um, statuses as well. So as a result of this, it becomes difficult to gain status legitimately. So you end up having a deviant career. And you see that with criminals, really, that they fail to get a job when they leave prison because the master status is a criminal and people don't want to employ them. So as a result, they turn back to being a criminal because they've got no other option. OK, so we've got two synoptic links there. We've got education that we know about and we've got crime and deviance that is to come as part of year two. So to evaluate, as we know from year one, labelling theory is accused of determinism. Not everyone that's le negatively labelled will go on to fail or go on to get a deviant career. We know criminals that have been to prison, they come out and they uh, become reformed and they get a legitimate job. And to back that up, we've got Murray Fuller's research into the black girls and their achievement. They demonstrated that they can reject the negative label. So that is our next theory, which is labeling theory. So make sure your grid is filled in and then we move on to our next action theory. Next, we have got part four, which is Goffman's dramaturgical model. Now, Irving Goffman was writing in the 1960s and he is focused on the key term impression management and we'll come back to that. But his main idea is, is that society is like a play and we can see that because we've got that word, the drama. So society is like a play. We are all actors. We follow a basic script. We use props. We have got front stage, backstage. We have makeup, we have costumes and all these are creating the person that we want the audience or other people to see. Now, he does also believe that there is some freedom in how we perform those roles. So we're going to do a short task. I want you to get a piece of paper and I want you to choose one of the following. And I want you to describe using these terms here what these one of these three people might do. So a student, a doctor or a police officer. So to perform their role as these individuals, what props would they use? What equipment would they use? What, where is their front stage? Where do they do the performance? How do they dress? Do they have a uniform? And um, just describe that person just so it goes into your head what the dramaturgical model is. And then when you're ready, join back in. Now we're going to continue to do some research. Like I said, right at the beginning, I want you to do as much observation as possible. So politicians often use this thing called impression management. OK, so we talked about that as being one of the terms that Goffman uses. And these impression management is how we portray ourselves to the wider audience. And it is making a way of how other people see you okay now you often do impression management especially if you've got social media and you have got instagram put your hands up who's got it or facebook or twitter the person that you put out there is an edited version of you you impression manage have you ever been um tagged in a photo where you go oh my god look at the state of me on that untag me i don't want to be on that picture 
that is you doing impression management you do not want that picture out there type thing so this is what we're going to do so I want you to do a little bit of research and uh, look at politicians so you've got some on there so Google or go on YouTube some of the politicians that you see so somebody like um, Donald Trump or Boris Johnson and you could even compare how um, someone like Putin or Obama, how did they present themselves? Do they do that in a different way? Or you might look at Theresa May. So how do they do it? But also think about why do they feel the need to do it as well? Okay, and once you're done, join back in. Now we do have one synoptic link with Goffman and we meet him again in year two. Once again, it's in the crime and deviance topic where we explore the effects of being labelled. And in this case, labelled with a mental illness resulting in admittance to an institution. So Goffman's, one of his famous pieces of work was called Asylum. And this shows the effects of being admitted to a thing called a total institution. Now prison is also a total institution and so is school. And what he believed was that the there was three processes that a person goes through when being admitted to a total institution. So the first one is mortification of the self. The old identity is replaced with a new one of that of an inmate. Okay. And how do we do this mortification of the self where we get rid of that person's old identity? We go through this thing called a degradation ritual. And all that means is that there is the the confiscation of personal items. So things that make you, you are taken away. It's all stripped away and in prisons and in asylums and in schools, they often have a uniform and that is taken away an individual identity. So you look the same. And as a result of these things, this process of institutionalization occurs. And that just means that this person is unable to readjust to the outside world. And you often hear that of prisoners, for example. Um, I'm not sure ever if you've ever watched the Shawshank Redemption, that one of the inmates there, when he left the prison, he'd done his time. He really struggled to be on the outside. And that's because of this institutionalization that he has suffered. Finally, to evaluate, this is a really useful way of demonstrating the roles that we play within society, that we perform these roles and we have got props and we have got loosely worded scripts that we perform day in and day out. Um, we also need to acknowledge that often people are doing two things at the same time we are playing the uh, the actor but we're also being the audience for somebody else and often it is unrehearsed which sort of goes against what Gotham was saying that we do follow a script to a certain extent okay so that is our next theory and join back in when you have completed your grid or your notes the next two action theories, phenomenology and ethnomethodology, are quite complex. So I'm going to try and give you the most basic and simplest explanation of what they are. Phenomenology, well, what that means simply is how we experience the world and how it appears to our senses. And this comes from this guy called Husserl. And he argues the world only makes sense because we construct mental categories to classify and file the information that we receive from our senses, from what we experience. The world as we know it is a product of our mind and how we have categorised things. So as you may be able to tell, the focus is more on the individual and the mind, and it has had some influence from philosophy in this sense. So an example of this is from Schutz and typifications. And Schutz argues that we categorise the world through categories or stereotypes. We use these to make sense of the world and not individual, but we share them with other members of society. And these typifications clarify the meanings and it just ensures that we're speaking the same language. We're seeing the world in the same way as your friends do or your parents, for example. So an important synoptic link comes from crime and deviance. So Citarell applies typifications to crime. 
Police officers apply common sense ideas or stereotypes of what the typical delinquent is like. And that means that they will then police certain types of areas and certain types of crime. Okay, so before we move on, I just want you to pause and just think, what is the typical criminal? What does the typical delinquent look like? How do they dress? What do they get up to? What type of crimes do they do? and discuss it with other people. Do they have the same idea as you do? Do you stay, have the same common sense ideas about what the typical delinquent is? Okay, and then when you're ready, join back in. Our next key idea is from ethnomethodology. And the key thinker is Garfinkel. And ethnomethodology is interested in the methods, and that's why I've highlighted it, that we use to produce the meanings to make sense of the world. Ethnomethodology is interested in how we make sense of the world. So he believes that society is an accomplishment, that the world is not just out there, rather we need to work hard to create social order. And this social order is called reflexivity and we work hard to do this. And Garfinkel demonstrated how fragile social order is by his breaching experiments. Okay, so we're going to have a go at this. So these experiments were designed to disrupt the social order. He aimed to demonstrate this by asking his students to act as a lodger in their own home. And this is what we are going to have a go at. Okay, so when you finish this video tutorial or do it now if you want to, and if you feel that you are okay to do this, have a little bit of a go, but I want you to act like a visitor in your own home and look at the responses of your other family members and make sure you tell them at the end, this is what you were doing and you were doing it for sociology. But give you some ideas what you can do. Be excessively polite like you would to, um, you know, if you were visiting somebody else's home. Ask permission to use the bathroom. May I get a glass of water? Why are you doing that? Is it okay if I can turn over the TV? Those types of things. Pretend to be ignorant of the coming and goings of the household. If you go out, don't let yourself back in. Knock at the door. Be a um, await to be invited in and I really look forward to you letting me know about what the reactions were of other people and this is just to demonstrate how fragile social life is so we have to work hard at creating the social order because it is really fragile and I want you to have a go at demonstrating that. So here's our synoptic link, an example of um, how to understand the social world so it appears orderly is in the case of suicide. Now, suicide is a really sensitive topic and it's often really hard to understand why a person might commit suicide. So in order to make sense of this world, we do look for patterns and clues in order to get answers. For example, coroners make sense of the deaths by looking for clues. So, for example, mental illness, were they unemployed and any clues about their death? Was there a, a note or, or something like that? And this shows how people just strive to impose order by seeking those patterns. So both phenomenology and ethnomethodology are both accused of just merely describing everyday actions. They ignore the structures that influence our actions. And with the case of ethnomethodology, the common sense knowledge or the shared knowledge are social facts, according to functionalist. And according to Marxist, the common sense knowledge that we hold is ruling class ideology that is shaping our behaviour. So we've just completed two more theories and just check that your table is up to date before we move on to our final one. So finally, we've got structuration theory and this is the work by Anthony Giddens. Now Giddens, he combines both structure and the action. He wanted to see the benefits of the social action approach. So the things that we've just been talking about with 
um, the structure of society. And he argues that there is this duality of the structure. So through our actions, we are reproducing the structure over time. And the structure sets out the norms which our actions are based on and one must create the other. So just to get you thinking about this, I thought, well, what example could I use to show that individual actions influences a structure and then that in turn influences a person's actions? So think about um, football, right? Okay. So football started off with just villagers just having a pastime on the day off. Usually it was on a... Um, um, like a holiday, a shared holiday, and they just started kicking around a pig's bladder. Gross, I know, but that was in the shape of a ball, right? And often they, they just had a loose aim of getting it from one side of the village to the other. There was no rules at all. You could kick it, throw it, run with it. There was no health and safety. It was quite violent. But eventually it started to get played at some of the public schools. Now, in order for it to become more of a sport, you needed to have rules. So now we're starting to put a bit of a structure to it. So they started to impose rules to it and depending on which public school that you went to, depended on the rules that, that got applied. So some of them, they um, could run with the ball um, and kick it as well. So that's where you start to see the, the birth of more rugby style. And others, they said, no, you can't run with the ball. You can only kick it. And that's where it became a bit more like football. Okay, so the next time we played it, the rules influenced the actions of the people that were playing it. So then we play it again, and then people say, a bit dangerous that, we're not having a two-footed tackle. Now, obviously, we've um, fast forward 100 years or so here, but what I'm trying to suggest is that the structure then somehow gets changed, and then that will influence the actions and so on, and that's how we start to see um, changes within society as well. Okay, so hopefully that example has demonstrated how your actions might influence the structure. So to evaluate, it overemphasizes the role of individuals in changing the structure. It, people might want to change it, but they don't have the power to do so. And Crabe argues it's not even a theory. It's just telling us what we would find if we look at society. Structure, rules and resources. So, as always, massive thank you for watching this tutorial. We've explored seven social action theories and any notes or anything that I've used, I have popped below. But as you see, thank you for watching. Click like, subscribe and share if you want. Bye.